I'm good. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Live Your Mission show brought to you by Mission Meets, where our guests share their most actionable advice so that you can live a more mission-centered life. I'm your host, Peter Alwood, and today we are joined by Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. But before we get to that, here's what's going on over at Mission Meets headquarters. I just want to give a quick shout out to two accounts that have given us some love on Instagram with reviews of the new Tasty Original Beef Jerky and the Carolina Reaper Jerky, which we feature here every week on the Liquid Mission Show. And those accounts are Dad Bod Snacks and the Tasty Turtle, two awesome accounts that reviewed our product. They review some really beautiful, tasty, delicious treats. They also review some questionable things. <laughs> I'll let you guys check those out for yourselves, but... I um, just want to give a shout out to both of those guys for sharing the love. Now back to the show. Okay, so today we're joined by B Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. This show is full of motivational stories from this guy, uh, stuff that's really happened, stuff that you can take and apply to your life where you can go from inaction to action. And so he shares a story of buying his first property at 20 while working at Coldstone Creamery. Right. And so I, I, I drill him on this a little bit because it's not anyone or most anyone that can go and they're making minimum wage or, you know, 10 bucks an hour or whatever it was that he was making at the time. Probably that probably wasn't minimum wage. And then go and also buy a property um, and 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 at the age of 20. OK. And so there's so much to learn here, whether you're that age or quite a bit older or somewhere in between, because all of us have these things that we haven't done yet that are debilitating, right? You think like, oh, I've never invested in real estate or I've never started a business or I don't know anything about e-commerce or I've never been able to get in shape or any of these things. And he, he gives kind of the steps, the things that he did, which I think is applicable to anyone, right? Which is going and reading, right? He read a hundred books in the summer, going and reading and learning everything that you can, but don't stop there. Then go find the people that have done what you've done. They're on the other side of never done it before, right? Never done X, Y, Z before. And start to do it, right? Talk to these people, ask them all the questions, all the things that you don't know about, all the things that you think are seemingly stupid questions to ask. Ask those questions from people or to ask those, you know, get question, answers from people um, that have already done it. That can say, oh, that's not a big deal. This is what you do there. This is what you do here. Take it and demystify it like, as we talk about it on the show. And so lots of great stuff here. I don't care if you're into real estate or not. It really doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It, what matters are the way that he has taken and defined processes, the way that he has increased the odds, the way that he's gone from inaction to action. All of us can take the tips here and apply those to our lives. And so I'm excited for you guys to listen to our conversation. And by the way, this dude killed the Reaper round. You've got to watch it. It's very funny, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's hilarious and informative. Nonetheless, we go through a lot of rapid fire, rapid fire questions. Excuse me. And so um, I won't belabor it anymore. Now, enjoy my episode with my uh, talented friend, Brandon Turner. What's up, man? Brandon, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you? Man, I'm I'm good. It's uh it's always good in Maui. So always you know. good. Every day. Every right. day. You don't I even never... check the weather, do you? No, I don't. No, it's always ninety two and sunny. <laughs> it is life. <laughs> I can I can attest. It is beautiful there, man. Yeah. I mean, it looks pretty nice there with that with a brick. I mean, that brick must cool you down a lot behind you. It does. So, it's yeah. nice, right? <laughs> right. And then tomorrow it'll be wood and then the next day it'll be whatever. It's amazing creates. how much work you put in every day to your set. That's really what I think we people want to take from this podcast episode is yeah. how much mo motivation they can get from watching you rebuild a set every time you talk. Every, every single it's day. Amazing. I spend amazing. more time on that than actually preparing to interview Brandon Turner. That's so, well, that's obvious because so. the, because <laughs> the brick is very important. Um, <laughs> but dude, listen, I, I thanks. Thanks for the time. Thanks for chatting and, and all the good stuff. I'm sure we'll have fun um, this afternoon ch talking, bro. Well, um, we will. Let's jump in. When someone asks you what you do, what do you say? Ooh, I, I love that question. Uh, it reminds me of Tim Ferriss saying, right? Like, what do you do? I, I deal drugs. That's now, right. I, uh, 
I am a real estate investor. That's what I say. First and foremost, for career-wise, I'm a real estate investor. I also happen to teach it, and I'm more well-known for teaching it than doing it. Yeah. But I like that. I want people to know I actually do this. Like, this is my full-time life is investing in real estate. Yeah. Why is that important to you to share that that bit? Yeah, because there's so many, for years, there's so many, like, gurus out there that got the reputation and, the, you know, the bad reputation rightfully so because they didn't actually do real estate. They just taught it and they didn't do it. And uh, I wanted to make sure that people know that I, I guess, I want to make sure that I'm always doing it. Even if I don't need to do it, I wouldn't do it because otherwise I'm just teaching something I don't do. And I think that's, uh, you lose touch a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just real estate, man. I mean, e-commerce gurus, yeah. Amazon sellers, yeah. like all these people that want to teach you how to do something they can't figure out how to do themselves, you know? Yeah. It's, I've heard this quote once and I don't remember the exact, so I'll butcher it, but it basically like, yeah, or today's gurus are yesterday's successes. Mm. And it's like, you know, you were really good back in, I mean, like, again, I mean, you and I both encountered, I tried to open an e-commerce store and like, I'm reading all these different people and I took a couple courses and I realized like they all made their money, like building this huge thing back in like 07, 08, 09, whatever, back when like it was very different than 2018, 19. Yeah. Uh, and so are they still doing it today? Some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. They're just teaching it. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, again, not like the worst idea in the world. Uh, it depends on what they're teaching, but uh, a lot of that's outdated. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. So what would you say your current mission is? Current mission. I'm going to read this because I don't have it perfectly memorized, even though this is my life's, or I'm going to call it mission life purpose. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say it that way. This is my life's purpose. And I, I worked through with a performance coach about a year ago. And uh, her name is Lauren, and she helped me work through a lot of this uh, life's purpose thing. So here's what I wrote down then, and I think it still applies today. Okay. My life's purpose is to empower people to move from pain to fulfillment by showing, speaking, and demonstrating to millions that life is beautiful and meant to be lived abundantly and with intention. So that's mm -hmm. a big, lofty thing, but basically the idea is it, I want to empower people. So I don't want to do it for them. I want to empower people. Uh, I want them to move from pain, which just means like discomfort, anything that's just bad. I, I don't like my job. I don't like my marriage. I don't like whatever. How do you move that from this sucks to this is great? So pain to fulfillment. And then the, the three ways I kind of do it is by showing people, by speaking it and uh, demonstrating it with my own life to millions. So lots of people that life is beautiful. And so like, this is where, like, what I mean by that is like, like life is actually really good. For the most part, we tend to dwell on the bad and we compare ourselves to somebody else's highlight reel all the time. But life is actually amazing. Like even if you live in the desert and it sucks, like it's an amazing thing. Like uh, no matter where you live, uh, it's, it's amazing. in like just the relationships and people, it's meant to be lived abundantly, which means we're not meant to just be living like, you know, like the small versions of ourselves. But I want people to live abundantly in whatever they do. Uh, and there's a... Uh, a lot of connotation with that word abundantly. There's actually, you know, a Bible verse about like, you know, I've come to, you know, that you have life abundantly. And I've always loved that phrase. Um, again, maximizing all areas of your life. And then with intention, meaning like we actually get a, a big say in what we do. We're not creatures like dogs or cats. Like we choose what we want. And when we're intentional about it, we can get there. So that yeah. is my mission. That's awesome, dude. You might oh, be the first person thanks. that's come here like totally prepared to share a very specific mission like that. So, no, well, thank well, you. Well done. Well done, <laughs> Turner. No, it's great, man. And so why, why are you working on this? Like, why are you the real estate guy? Why are you Beardy yeah. Brandon? Why are you the host of the show? Yeah. Why are you the right person for the job? Uh, luck, right place, right time. Uh, in, in a, a lot of ways. Um, so my, I mean like without giving the, the full story, uh, I got into real estate when I was 21. I started doing it. I, I think I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. I started reading books about financial independence. I bought a property. I rented out the bedrooms. I was like, this is great. And then I bought a duplex. I lived in one of the units and I rented the other one out. And I was like, this is really great. I still remember that day, actually. I mean, this is actually a cool story in that, like, I remember the day my tenants who lived in the front house, and it was actually a friend of mine, which is a terrible idea. Don't rent to your friends. But my friend, because later he got arrested and shipped off and it was bad. Anyway, so he, uh, he, Comes back and he pays me rent. Uh, and he pays me $650 in cash, like 650 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I remember holding that money going, well, my mortgage is only like $600 or 620 Like insurance, taxes, mortgage, everything. And I just got $650. i am living for free right now, which means that if I don't want to have a job, so I actually ended up not having a job. I quit my job to flip houses. And that feeling is what I want more people to have. That idea of like, I don't have to have this job. Like I can live a life of intention uh, something that I want to do 
because uh, as soon as we're freed up from that life of like having to commute an hour to work, having to work this job that we don't like, and once we are freed from that, like anybody who can achieve that financial independence doesn't achieve, like doesn't take it, but it frees you up to do other things. So you can actually help the world and, and help people around you and, and make life better for others when you're no longer consumed by this got to pay my bills, work this crappy job just to make enough money to pay the bills cycle that just goes around and around. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think what you're saying yeah. is that it's once you have margin, you can start thinking about those things, right? Like once you mm. get above. So margin, that's a weird way to put it. I've never thought of that, but I yeah. love that. So, yeah. well, so you were working a job when you were getting this 650 bucks from your, from your budget. Yeah. Right? yeah. I was working like this minimum, basically just above minimum wage. Uh, I went a couple different jobs, but it was basically, I went from like a group home for like uh, developmentally disabled adults to Cold Stone Creamery singing for tips. It was great. Mm -hmm. And I gained like 50 pounds that year because you got free <laughs> ice cream every time you worked. And it was unbelievably good. And then I uh, I quit my job, started flipping houses. That didn't work out so good. I mean, like, because it was 07. So the mortgage, I mean, the whole entire world was melting down. Mm -hmm. So I ended up keeping it with rentals and I fell in love with rentals. Then I went and got a job at a bank for a while. That was horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I learned a lot. But uh yeah, that was around that period uh, is uh, the bank, I think, is when I bought that duplex somewhere around there. OK, so dude, yeah. help me out here. You you bought a duplex. You bought you started buying houses to flip while you're working at Coldstone. Yeah, let's see. The first one I was working, I think the very first one I was working when I started about the house, I was at that group home making, I think, eleven dollars an hour. And then I went to Coldstone and that actually dropped me to like eight dollars an hour. But I got tips, that, you know, so that bumped me to like twelve. Yeah, so I bought it in there, that very first one. Okay. And, uh, yeah. All right. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Help, help me understand this a little bit. You're yeah. working for eleven dollars an hour, and you get into real estate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So someone listening is going to think, well, this guy's got some sort of superpower because I don't know anybody. I don't personally know anybody that's making eleven dollars an hour that's also thinking about and actually well, executing on real estate, right? Well, my 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 dad gave me a loan of seven million dollars, uh, interest free, <laughs> when I got. <laughs> <laughs> no okay uh no that's not true uh the first deal i mean th okay so the first one i was making almost no money i mean there's a lot of loans out there they still exist today i mean i the, the specific loan i got doesn't exist today but there's things like fha loans they're like three and a half percent down mm -hmm. so i think total down i needed like the house was like 80 grand it was in a lower price market about two hours from seattle i didn't like the market very much my wife grew up there though so i ended up there for a while mm -hmm. and uh yeah, it was like 80 grand. So I needed like 2,500 bucks plus closing costs. It was like three, three or thirty five hundred dollars down. I don't even think I had that. I think that money, I think I either borrowed from a friend or sold something. I don't know. I somehow scraped it together mm -hmm. and was able to do it. And same with the duplex. I paid 80 or 85. I'm like this stuff is not terribly expensive. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, well, yeah, well, sure. If you live in the middle of nowhere. I mean, this isn't completely the middle of nowhere. It's two hours from Seattle. Mm -hmm. So like uh, one of the more expensive markets in the country. Yeah. Yeah. So we made it work. Okay. So there's two parts to this though, man. I mean, one is I, one is actually having the audacity to go do it when you're not making a whole lot of money. Right. Um, and actually being confident enough to do that. And two is to actually, um, to, to, to execute on it. Right. And so I think that for someone who's out there, who's thinking, you know, that's not for me, or once I get a higher paying job, or once I have a little bit more security, then then I'll start to think about it. But then even then, I'm not going to execute on it. I, I guess I want I want the listener, the viewer to, to fit kind of get in, into your mind a little bit and to figure out kind of like what was going on? Like, how did you overcome the idea that you weren't making enough money? Or the fact that you had never done it before, and then you were just going to go from not doing to doing? Take walk us through that a little bit. Sure. Uh, I, I think a big part of it was just the, the, so. And you, I, and you were young. You were how, yeah, how old? 20, 20, okay, 21. Okay, dude, yeah. you got like everything to me, everything stacked up against you and you just did it anyways. How? It's the, it's the beard. You get, it's like <laughs> super power. No, I, um, I, I think okay, a couple of things. One, John Grish, Grisham, Grisham ruined, like changed my life. Okay. And not a lot of people can say that about a fiction writer, right? But you know, I think a fiction writer wrote all these books about like lawyer stuff. And I read The Firm, and then I read a couple other books by him back when I was like 20, and I really liked his writing. But every book he wrote was about how horrible it was being a lawyer. At the time, I was actually studying for law school, and I got a degree in history, so I was going to go to law school because that's all you can do with a history degree, really, or teach maybe. But So I was going to go to law school, and then I kept reading this stuff about like you work like 60, 70, 80 hours a week, and you, you make a basic salary unless you get into like a top you know two or three school. You make a pretty 
basic salary for 20 or 30 years until maybe if you're really good, you retire as partner someday and maybe make a million dollars a year as partner. Mm-hmm. And it was like, is it worth the 60, 70, 80, 100 hours a week for years of a mundane job you don't like just for that? And for a lot of people, the answer is yeah, definitely worth that for that retirement. But for me, I was just like, uh uh-uh, like that sounds horrible. So I stopped and I did not, I I chose not to go to law school because of John Grisham. And instead at the same time was when I bought my very first house, which I rented out to the the buddies. And because like, I mean, like here's, here's the logic. You gotta pay to live somewhere anyway. So the best way to get started in real estate is to just somehow combine your house with your investment, like the idea of an investment. So I, all I knew, I had a garage sale mom. Did you have a garage sale mom? Like garage sale every Saturday morning? Okay. Yeah. I grew up every Saturday morning. We go to garage sales, pile all the kids in the van and we just hit garage sales. So all I knew was like buy cheap, like negotiate and buy cheap. So I bought the cheapest house that they had for sale and I fixed it up myself. Just like I bought a book from Home Depot, one, two, three home improvement. <laughs> and like, I literally like figured out how to do, I had never touched a hammer in my life. I just wow. like figured stuff out from this book. Yeah. And uh, I still have that book today. Anyway. And uh yeah, and then I rented the bedrooms out. That's such an easy, I mean, you have to live anyway, but all of a sudden I was living for free anyway. And so, and then when I bought the duplex, it was the same thing. So it wasn't like giant steps. It wasn't like I'm gonna go buy an apartment complex. I mean, like we're closing on Monday on a 168 unit mobile home park. Like mm-hmm. I'm not gonna start with a trailer park when I'm 20 years old, but buying a, a little duplex, uh, true story, a couple of years later after that duplex, uh, we moved, you know, we moved on and we moved to another property another duplex actually, but we moved on and the tenants that lived in both halves, uh, the people that lived in the front of it said people kept taking pictures of the house and nobody knew why. Like we didn't know why the tenants didn't know why. And we thought the county was like reassessing or something. Anyway, finally we figured out what it was when, when some Swedish tourists knocked on the door and they wanted a tour of Kurt Cobain's house. And so we found out this was actually Kurt Cobain's childhood home. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. He lived in both halves of it. So he lived in the, like that one half and then he moved to the other half. And so I'm probably the only person alive that owns two of Kirk Cobain's homes. Now, granted, he moved when he was like two years old, but whatever. He was yeah. a baby. He drooled on my carpet. So I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. Anyway, so it. yeah, that's I guess it was just baby steps. Well, so um, I understand the baby steps, but what to me is is uh, surprising and also inspiring is that you were able to take the first step. And so for the listener who's like, they want to go from not doing to doing, and it could be real estate, could be anything. What switched in your mind to where you're like, dude, I'm, just, I'm taking the first step. I'm going to do it. One. Okay. But I want to say it's re- like reading is like, is huge, right? The more I read, the more comfortable I felt. Like I always say like, you know, um, the idea of like the more you read, right? The more it affects who you are. That's why if you read a bunch of like, you know, I don't know, communist literature, you're probably going to end up being communist. Like you just naturally become like what you read. Mm-hmm. And so by reading, I mean, I read a hundred real estate books over a summer. Like that first summer, I read a hundred books. I went to the library and I checked out over the, every week I'd go there and get like 10 to 15 books, everything they had in their system. I would ship new ones in from the other libraries nearby. And I read every single book they had on real estate. Wow. Cause I just knew, like, I just knew in my heart that like, I did not want the life that everyone else has, which is the, you know, slave away at a job you don't like until you're too old to enjoy life. Mm-hmm. And so I knew, and I knew that real estate was probably going to be the best way to get out of that. Uh, and so I just jumped all in and it fascinated me. Uh, and so the more you read, the more like competent you become in that subject. And then therefore the more, um, proficient you become and the more like normal it seems. I mean, we all, we're all afraid in the beginning to drive a car. Most people are, you're three years old. You're not going to go drive a car. That's too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But today we drive cars without even thinking about it. It's all just, uh, you know, automatic in our heads. We don't even, you know, you ever drive down the road that like get like six miles down the road and you realize you have no idea like how you got there. Like you're just like. That whole thing was on autopilot. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's a quote I heard recently, and I don't, I'm, I don't know who said it originally or what, but basically the idea is nothing in life is difficult. It's just steps that you haven't defined or rehearsed. Hmm. So, I mean, anything like I want to lose weight. It's not hard to lose weight. It's just you haven't defined what the steps are, or you haven't rehearsed them enough to actually get the the results you want. Now, obviously, some things in, are hard. I mean, cancer is hard, and you know, divorce is hard. But business wise, mm-hmm. so anyway. You just define the steps, make it very, very clear mm-hmm. what those steps are. And the books help with that. Getting around other investors. I got around some other investors in the local area. Like, they're just like, oh, yeah, that's no problem. It's, it's easy. And then you just kind of naturally not afraid anymore. Same way if you want to lose weight, right? I mean, you know, this if you want to, like, lose weight or get a six-pack or whatever. You start hanging around people who just that's a normal life for them. Yeah. You just naturally are no longer afraid. You just start taking the right steps, I think. Yeah. And life feels more abundant that way. So to me, yeah. like while you're while you were talking about reading the hundred books, I've, I'm thinking that 
you surrounded yourself with virtual successes, right? Like people that were like, oh, I'm doing it. No big deal. This is how you do it. Step by one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. And you read that over and over and over again to where you almost had like a virtual um, community of people that were, you know, as one, as um, you know, one directional, right? You're, they were just talking at you through the books, yeah. but it made it feel normal to you, right? Yeah. And then, and then you surround yourself with real people. With real people, and, well, and then kind of a mixture in between. I mean, this is actually when I found Josh Dorkin in Bigger Pockets. Okay. So in the beginning, like I, a lot of people think, I started Bigger Pockets back in the day, but it, it, I found Bigger Pockets because I, at that very first property I bought, the very first one, I told my dad, I'm not going to law school anymore. I'm going to jump in and be a real estate investor. And he said, that's a horrible idea. You're going to lose everything and go bankrupt and live under a bridge. And he said, because what happens, Brandon, if your tenants don't pay rent? What are you going to do then? And I was like, I don't know. I don't have any money. I can't afford that. So I was like, I guess I'll go to law school. Maybe I can watch them dancing with the stars every night until I'm 65 years old. And so instead, uh, I typed into Google what to do when tenants don't pay rent. And this little forum came up that like nobody was on yet called Bigger Pockets. And somebody asked the question, what do you do when tenants don't pay rent? And it was like an article about that. Um, it wasn't before, it was before blogs. It was like an article, just what Josh called it, an article. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it, I don't even remember what it said, but I printed it out. And what it did is it gave me hope that like there are answers to these problems. To everything that somebody says, like, well, you can't do, you can't do e-commerce because of this. Oh, that only worked back in this time. Or that you know, everyone has a reason why you shouldn't do something. But there's an answer to every one of those. So I found that Bigger Pockets community and I started asking questions in the forums and, and that's how I got connected with uh, Bigger Pockets very early on. Yeah. And then so. you and then you found people in your local community. And then that, I found people in my local community that were doing it. Yeah. In fact, I, I went and painted a house with my, my, my best friend Adam. So Adam was uh, he had just painting his landlord's house. And then he needed help with it. So I went and painted with him for a whole day. And I met his landlord and we went and talked for like an hour while my buddy's outside painting. I'm just inside talking to the landlord, just asking him like, how do you do this? And I'm just really intrigued by his story. And funny, I never thought about this before, but it's kind of like, I used to always like interview people on their stories. It's funny that now I'm a podcaster interviewing on their stories, but he, he liked me, this landlord. And so he hired me to paint another house of his. So he asked me to bid it. I said, $250. So I painted an entire house for him to for 250 bucks. And I did it in like two days. So I, you know, it was good money, I suppose. Uh, but what really happened is then I became his, like his guy. And so me and this, like every time I had a question about anything, like this guy was there and he ended up like later on connecting with lenders and, and, and like, I don't know, just mentored me a lot along the way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think so the, to me, the massive lesson here is to go and see, right? Nick says this all the time, go and see. So you, you learn through books, but then you, yeah. you, then you were surrounded by actual people that were doing it. That will just, it demystifies the whole process. Right. Yeah. And so like when people want to talk to me, I got a friend of mine after this recording, we're to talk e-commerce. He's probably got I, things in his head that are just like this. What of my, what happens when my tenants move out? He's got these daunting questions that I have very simple answers yep. for because I've already gone through all those things. Yep. Right. There are no new problems with it. And in it. And so he's like, he can ask me these questions. I'm like, dude, don't worry about that. This is what you do. And don't worry yeah. about that. And we can demystify all those things. Um, so recently moved. And for me, I think this demystification applies to a lot of different things. Right. And so if you feel like there's not an abundance of money or there's not an abundance of opportunity, get around people that have an abundance of money and abundance of opportunity. And you'll yeah. think, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's, it's really simple. So we move here. And I'm meeting a friend that I hadn't seen in a long time. You know, he was a, a, kind of more of an acquaintance. And um, he, I, I walk everywhere. So you know that about me. I walk everywhere, right? Even mile two, I don't care. I'm walking, right? We've had one car for a very long time. Doesn't bother me, right? And so I walk to the coffee shop. He shows up, you know, I'm meeting with him like an hour later. And um, we're going to go grab a bite. And he's like, oh, you walked? Well, just come ride with me. So I come around the corner and he's in a McLaren, right? So if you don't know what a McLaren is, quarter million dollar car, right? Yeah. I don't even know how to get in there, bro. I don't even know how to open the door. Like, I'm like, where are the handles? I don't know what to do. He's like, there's a secret button you press there and a window goes on. Right. I get in there. And for me, demystified like supercars and expensive cars. It's like, oh, this guy's 31. He drives a supercar. It must not be that big a deal. Right. And his everyday car costs about three times as much as my everyday, everyday car. Right. But you got to get around these types of people. And it's not just about money, right? It's about making decisions. It's about doing different things. If you've never been able to get in shape, get around a bunch of people that are in shape. They'll show you yeah. what it takes. And yeah, they really like, will. Oh, oh, I just do X, Y, and Z. This is all they do. And it's, it's, it's just part of their daily life. Just like real estate for you, just part of your daily life. No big deal, right? Yeah, to go to, to go to that whole, like, the things aren't hard. They're just steps that you haven't defined or you haven't practiced them enough. Mm -hmm. So when you get around those people, like, like they've, they know the steps and they practice them. 
And so it's not hard for them. Like, I mean, when somebody's like, I, I do these webinars every week for bigger pockets. I teach people and like, I always get questions like, yeah, but what do you do if a tenant doesn't do this? Like everyone has this concern about like, well, how do you fix toilets then in the middle of the night? And I'm like, that's such a basic question. That's like, I figured out that out like 12 years ago, but like, that's a big issue to people. So yeah. it's, but if you get around me and you ask me that question, I'm gonna be like, dude, this is what you do. Here's the steps. It's easy. Mm -hmm. you, you call a plumber and they come and take care of it the next day. Like it's like, you know, but yeah. to them, it's such a big deal today though. Like this morning I told you, asked me before we started recording how I was doing today. I said, Oh man, it's been one of those days. Cause like we're doing this huge real estate raise right now. Big fun. We're doing all the stuff that you know about. Mm -hmm. And like, it's just been a tough day trying to close on this property. It's supposed to close Monday. We might have to kick it a little, another couple days. And then I thought this morning, I was like, this is stupid. Somebody here has this answer and has gone through this before. So I go on my Facebook. I'm like, oh yeah, here's a guy that's bought 25 mobile home parks in the last year. I just like message him. Hey, do you have 15 minutes? I can ask you a couple of questions today. Yeah, no problem. I get on the phone with him. And like, he's just like, oh yeah, no problem. This is what you gotta do. And here's the, here's the situation. Yeah, we've been through that too. It wasn't hard for mm -hmm. him. So anyway, the more you can do that in your life without being like, you know, I, I don't like the whole like, can I just like take you out to coffee for the next three hours and pick your brand on everything in the world. But yeah come with a specific question or like, Hey, this is what I'm dealing with. How do I, how do I get over this fear or this problem? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's a, that is a critical component. Like show that you've put the work in, you know, yeah. I used to have this filter. So, you know, you know, where I ran another podcast and did a show yeah. and stuff and it has happened to you all the time. I know it does where people are like, Oh, Hey, just want to pick your brain. Think about starting a podcast. I'm like, yeah. Well, how far, you know, how much work have you done? Right. So usually I send, I had this canned email response had all this work, like six hours of videos to watch and all the same yep. stuff that I did to learn how to podcast. Yep. And I'll say, as soon as you get through that, let me know the questions that you have and I'll, I'm happy to answer them. How many, nobody, ever me, nobody replies. Nope, nobody. They have put the I work know. in. It's, but yeah, you put the yep. work in and you got 15 minutes. Like you've put a lot of work in. You got, you've led legitimate yep. 15 minutes of questions to ask and you don't know how to answer them and you've done your homework. Cool. Um, dude, so I, I love that, man. So just people got to just go and see and then talk to the people and surround yourself with people that have moved and done it, right? Yeah, now, very much. dude, of all the things you've had to do and to get all the things you've had to get better at in order to become the real estate expert, right? To be the person that you are, what's been the hardest? What's been the hardest to overcome? Mm, I'm going to go with a couple, a uh, couple things. One, managing people rather than doing everything myself has been very difficult. You know, I, in the beginning, I didn't know how to do anything, right? I said, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to manage people or I didn't know how to do the actual work on a property. Mm -hmm. So I bought a book at Home Depot and I learned how to do the work. Mm -hmm. Today, I can do any, I mean, I could re-roof your house. I could fix your foundation. I could fix your plumbing. Like, it doesn't matter. I can do anything. Mm -hmm. That has held me back a lot because when you know how to do everything, you never get out of that trap of learning the more valuable skill in life, which is how to get other people to do those things for you. Yeah. Uh, there's a, uh, a interview of a billionaire. I don't remember who it was, but they, he, he said, as a billionaire, why is successful? And he said, I'm a quitter. And the guy said, well, what do you mean by that? He's like, all I do is quit. No matter what I do, I think, how do I get somebody else who's better at this to do this instead of me? Yeah. And he's like, my entire life, the last, whatever, 70 years, all I do is quit everything that I do so somebody else can take it over. And I just remember thinking that was such a great thing. So I, I had a hard time. I actually had to literally sell all of my tools, like just unload all of my tools in order for like me to stop doing all the work every time. So, yeah, 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 that was, that was huge. Uh, the other, the other side of things was, uh, I had this, I, I call it a limiting belief. We'll call it a limiting, limiting belief. I don't like raising money. I don't like raising money. And so like in real estate, you oftentimes have to raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like a couple of years ago, I tried to talk to a couple of my buddies uh, that were uh, in real estate somewhat. And I thought had some money and I was like, Hey, I'm trying to buy this deal. Do you guys want to like put in some money? And we'll buy it together. And they shot me down. And my like, you know, on the disc profile, I have a high eye. Like I really like people liking me, like just devastated me. I'm like, I'm never asking for money again, ever. I'm never going to raise money again. So getting over that, cause like to get to like the next level where I'm trying to achieve in my real estate, like which is like a big, large company. I'm on a thousand units in three years is kind of my goal. Mm -hmm. You got to raise money. And so I had to get over that. And that was really hard for me to figure out how to get through that. And when I finally did it and I like, did it the right way and asked a bunch of people, how do you do it? Like we, we like raised the entire fund in like, I don't know, like two days yeah. of what, you know, with verbal commitments of people saying, y'all do it. Like it was like there, but getting over that was hard because we tell ourselves these stories of like, I'm not good at this. I don't like to do this. I hate this thing. And the more we tell ourselves that, the more we believe that and it becomes like, you know, ingrained in our head that we're not good at something. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the idea of quitting is interesting because in the beginning, you really did. You really do need to know all these different things. It's important yeah. to have 
depth perspective and experience doing the plumbing or figuring out like all these different aspects of real estate. Yep. I think the trouble is, and this is not just real estate, this is entrepreneurship, this is running a business in general, is that you continue to wear all the hats for way too long. Maybe, yeah. maybe ever, right? I mean, my parents were in a grocery store and they work seven days a week for six years and the remaining 18 years or whatever it is, they work six days a week. They did, wow. they, they did everything, man. They hired everything. some people, right? But they did everything. And so I think that's not super uncommon. I think that you, you feel like, well, I'm going to pay them X amount of dollars per hour. I can do a better job. Now I got to manage yep. them and I got to do, oh, what if they don't deliver? What, you know? And then you realize that once you start to delegate and quit, as you say, um, that there, it's far more beneficial and you have far more leverage to do the things that you're best at, yeah. which is now but that's a skill. Finding, finding deals, right? It's definitely a skill though, learning how to find talent, manage talent, work with people. Like that is a skill that is very difficult to obtain. Mm -hmm. Not because it's hard, but because you have steps that you haven't defined yet or you haven't practiced them enough. Yeah. And so the answer, like for me, it was read a, I, I mean, I switched, I, I, for, for a decade, all I read was real estate books. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally had this realization that I need to get better at business, I switched and now all I read pretty much is business books. Mm -hmm. And I, I talk with other business owners. You and I have had a million conversations about business stuff. Yeah. Because that's what has helped my business grow the last few years to exponentially much, you know, exponentially higher than it was before because now I'm getting better at the business side of things. It yeah. doesn't mean it's hard. It just means I haven't defined the steps or gotten around people who are good with that yet. Absolutely. So. And the thing is, I guess, to, to clarify, it's like it's, not, it's okay to wear all the hats forever if that's what you want to do. And if you yeah. want your business to stay a certain size, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it staying at the size yeah. that it's at. Just know that you're making an intentional decision that if you cannot delegate, you can't quit, you can't do these certain things, um, you don't want to go from really reading real estate books to business books, it's going to hamstring your business. And it's going yeah. to stay, you're going to stay maybe self-employed versus as an entrepreneur. That's okay. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Just know that if you're frustrated with the growth, you're probably the problem, right? You're probably yeah. part of the problem, right? Um, because you're not getting out of the way, so to speak. Um, yeah. Okay, man. So for, for the viewer, for the listener that wants to live out their mission, per your advice, you know, as it, as it pertains to your journey, are there a couple things where you're like, these are the two things that I really think you need to focus on? Is it the getting out of the way or quitting, as you say? Is it something else? Um, maybe you can even look back and think, those are, the, those are a couple of the other things that I haven't mentioned yet that were kind of slowing me down. Do you have a couple? Yeah. Things? I mean, are you, are you thinking... Or referring to real estate specifically or just everything I've, you know, just success in general? I'm thinking success in general. I'm thinking if you're looking at your timeline and you can look back and you can point out a couple of things like these are the couple of things I wish I knew. Yeah. Oh, here's a good, here's a big one. And this is real estate, but this is almost anything business or sales wise, but especially real estate, it uh, applies to me. Nobody ever explained it to me like this is like everything is a funnel. I mean, so many things in life are a funnel. Uh, what I mean by that is like, if you want to, if you want to get married like increase the number of potential people. You know, if you're a guy and you like women, then increase the number of women that you surround yourself with. And some of those you're gonna become friends with. Some of them you're gonna become romantic with. And maybe one of them you're gonna get married. But if you just never start at the top of the funnel, you never get there. It applies to everything we do in life almost entirely. And I wish I would have thought about real estate that way earlier on. And this is just basic business, right? If there are, if I have a thousand leads come across my desk every month and out of them I analyze a hundred of them and I make an offer on 20 of them, I'll probably get some accepted. So all you need to do to get more deals is just to go up the funnel and just increase each part or optimize it. And again, that's not just real, it's everything. I mean, that's how Bigger Pockets has grown. It's like four, four or five years ago, Josh and I sat down and go, this is a funnel, let's define the steps and then set some goals for each part of the funnel. So thinking about your business in that way, in terms of like, where is the funnel and how can you optimize them? And this is exactly what every big business does. They're constantly looking at their percentages. What's the conversion rate? What's the opt-in rate? What's the registration rate? Whatever those rates are, knowing what they are right now, getting a good grip on that, and then knowing where you want them to be, you can basically just reverse engineer your entire success in any business whatsoever. Um, not that it gives you every answer in the world, but it sure solves a major problem, and that's probably sales. So I wish I would have known that earlier on. Yeah, it's a huge yeah, one. The, yeah, it's huge. And I, I guess I, I never learned it from a real estate book. I only ever learned like until I started reading business books and get around business people. Uh, in fact, yeah, that was huge. Um, and it ties in with like the second thing I'll say is like process is more important than like outcome necessarily. Like, you know, I want to buy a real estate deal. People are so focused on the outcome. I want to buy a real estate deal or I want to start a business. I want to sell e-commerce. I want to be a millionaire. I want to retire early rather than what's the process required to get you there. 
So I remember there's this book, The Miracle Morning, which Hal Elrod yeah. wrote. Then they have a bunch of spinoff books that they've written. One of them was called The Miracle Morning for Salespeople. And I remember there's a line in there, and I, I quote it all the time. I love this quote. He said, every result that you desire is preceded by a process required to produce the result. And it said, when you define your process and commit to it for an extended period of time, the results take care of themselves. So it's not about put, taking that picture of a guy with a six pack and putting it on my ceiling and waking up to him every morning going, I want to look like that. It's like, what's your process? Have you defined it? And are you sticking with it long enough? Mm -hmm. And that's going to get you there. Uh, so defining a process uh, for anything in life, uh, and that boils down to oftentimes a sales funnel. So I think that made a huge impact when I heard that. And that's why I still remember it to this, to this day. Those are both huge, man. So the first one is increasing the odds. And yeah. why aren't we doing it? It makes sense, right? If, if it's, if it's going to take, and Nick and I just talked about this on the intro episode, if you know you're going to have a 10% success rate or conversion rate, then you yeah. know you're going to get nine rejections. Yep. Is that why, is that why we're not yeah. going for more, right? We, I don't like, okay, you're a perfect example. You try to raise money, right? Yeah. People shot you down. Yeah. You could be like, F this. I can't do it, right? I, I can't handle the rejection. <laughs> I pretty much did. Right? <laughs> I was like, yeah, and you give screw up, this. But you only tried one, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if you know that you're going to have a 10% success rate, then you're going to get nine no's. Yep. And we couldn't handle one, right? Yep. But if I just but understanding go ahead, go ahead. but understanding that you've got to get to the through the nine in order to get the tenth one, which is going to say yes, it's kind of liberating, right? You're like, dude, that's okay. That's just one more closer to a yes. Um, yep. But we don't like we human beings. We don't like rejection. We don't like losing. We don't like failing. We're taught in school not to fail. You got to get the A, right? But if you knew, like, dude, I got to get nine Fs in order to get an A, you'd be fine with the Fs, right? Yeah. Um, and so I just feel like we've got to get over the fact that we lost or we quit or we failed because you just, you got, those have to happen. You know, you learned yeah. a lot from those notes, right? You learned that yeah. maybe you were a little bit more vulnerable than you wanted to be yeah. and that you're a little bit more sensitive to it than you wanted to be. Um, but you also learned how to do it right the next time. And it may not have worked the second time, but you damn sure weren't going to quit. And you're going to go for a third or a fourth. And so is that what it is, man? I mean, and how can we get over that fact of like, yeah, well, you might lose sometimes. It might not work. I mean, the phrase I tell myself all the time is it's just a numbers game. I always say that it's just a numbers game. Anytime something goes wrong, I'm like, it's just a numbers game. Mm -hmm. And I tell people around me, like a couple weeks ago, we made an offer on a deal. It got rejected. Uh, and I, my, a couple of guys on my team came up and they were like, yeah, I think we should maybe reconsider like shifting our strategy a little bit. And I'm like, we, we had one, we got one, one rejection. <laughs> like, we, like yeah. when we get 99 rejections, come to me and let's talk about changing our strategy. Yeah. But one rejection, maybe two, like it's just a numbers game. Mm -hmm. Like let's, let's make sure we're not making decisions based on emotion. And so the more you can make that a mathematical kind of a thing. And I, when we literally do it with like whiteboards, like this is how many offers we're making. This is how many rejections we got. We try to track those things very, very carefully because that way it takes it out of the emotional part and it puts it on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard and says, oh yeah, we're, we're here. We're operating at an 87%, you know, failure rate. Mm -hmm. Great. That means 13% success rate. Yes. You know, so I think we, we learn in, in, in high school or in, you know, college, we learn that a 60% is a D and we learn that a 50%, you know, you're, I mean, if you got 50%, you're failing and that's a bad thing where in real estate, like again, one out of 10 is typically my acceptance rate. If I get one out of 10 accepted, that, that's a, that's about normal. So people are like, wow, you got 90% failure rate. What a loser. <laughs> and I'm like, I mean, if you could consistently get a 90% failure rate, you will be a multimillionaire in under a decade. Because mm -hmm. all it means is you got to make enough offers and then you'll be fine. That 10% is what's going to make you wealthy in, in anything and not just real estate. Yeah. And I think the visualization of having it on the whiteboard, it takes mm -hmm. the emotion out of it, right? You're like, yeah. Because if you saw on the whiteboard that you had a zero out of one, you're like, oh, I only tried one time. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> you you got to take it away from your the brain that just gets all emotional and sad. Yeah. And put it on a board and like our goal make, I mean, we did it for a while. Yeah. It's still actually up there. Look at, I mean, I'll even show you right there. It's up on this. Uh, you can't really say it. Anyway, it's up on that, on my black whiteboard. Yeah. And there's literally just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 boxes across the top of my, my white blackboard. And there's X's. Every time we made an offer, we put an X on there. Mm -hmm. And so we knew I, I, cause I said, if we, if we make 12 offers this month, we'll probably get one of them accepted. We actually, out of those eight, we ended up getting three of them accepted of the eight offers we that we have checked on there. So we stopped making offers because we got three of them accepted. 
but it, it made it a whole lot more reasonable because we're like, oh, we still have a lot more to go before we get to the end of that row. So just having like check boxes or something simple like that mm-hmm. takes it out of the emotion and you're not making rash decisions. You're just like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work my, my process. Yep. Yep. And defining the process you talked about, I'll touch on real quick because you turned them into a book yeah. called Four Disciplines of Execution. And it's been pivotal for us. We've actually um, implemented it at home, which I'll, this, that's for another episode. But, um, and it is just like, these are the things you're going to do, right? And that's your yep. lead measure on the board there. It's just like, we're going to do 12 and we're going to yeah. check 12. That's all we're going to do. And yep. that'll figure out that that will determine and give you a higher likelihood of a positive outcome, right? Here, here's another thing on that note I'll say is if you can find your ways to reward yourself, even small little ways to reward yourself in the process of working your process, no weird pun intended, but like in the process of working your process, if you can find little ways to reward yourself every time you fail or whatever. So I'll give you a good example. A process, my dog got like reverse potty trained. He was potty trained. He's no longer when we moved to Hawaii. And I think it's largely because we have windows everywhere in our house and he can't figure out what's inside and outside and he's just stupid. But also like I stopped like putting him out so often. I just put a doggy door and he doesn't want to use it. So I realized my process, I define my process and commit to it. The process is I take him out every three hours. I take him out the back door. I watch him go to the bathroom and come back in again. That's a process. However, I wasn't doing it. I knew mentally that I needed, I just need to do that every single day for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. And he'll be potty trained again, mm-hmm. but no, I would just wouldn't do it. I'd be like, I haven't taken him out in like three days, you know, like other than like he keeps pooping on the floor and I'll say like, this isn't working, right? Well, of course it's working. I've, I'm not working. My process isn't. So you know what I did is I bought a bag of my favorite candy. My favorite candy. If you had those like, uh, they're like chocolate, like dark chocolate flavored like, or blueberry flavored dark chocolates. Mm-hmm. It's not like Costco in these big bags. Anyway, they're unbelievably good and unbelievably bad for you. Like horrible, I'm sure. But they're so good. It's like Brookstone or something like that. So I, I buy this little bag of them. Yeah. I know. I, I know the guy who started that company. Do you really? Yeah. I just oh met him gosh, recently. So good. Yeah. Brookstone. That's funny. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're so good. So I bought a little package of these and I love them, but I can't eat them because I will eat the entire bag. I once ate almost the entire bag from Costco and there's like 30,000 calories, I think, in a bag. So I buy the little bag and then I hung it up next to where I take the dogs out. And when I take the dogs out, I get one little chocolate blueberry. Mm. And it, it, that's like literally it changed overnight from me going like, oh, I'm not working my process. I got to take the dogs out. I'm out here in the shed. They're like, I get a chocolate blueberry. Like I like literally like I'll run in and take them out for one stupid little chocolate. And it's 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 weird how we operate. And maybe I'm the only one that operates this way. But I think we just operate on this little like wins like oh i get something good out of it i'm gonna do it and so then i'm i'm way more consistent when i give myself my chocolate you're just training yourself man i mean just that's like what a, it is just like a dog just like a child i give him a treat <laughs> and then i have his treats and my treats right next to each other i give him a treat and i give me a treat and we're both happy we're both ecstatic when he goes potty it's great hey man whatever it takes dude I love whatever it. it takes i love it all right man we are running out of time we haven't even got to the reaper round so let's switch gears. this is where our guests answer some rapid fire questions while they attempt to eat some of our, or maybe a whole, whole bag. Do I have to do it with a hat on too? Oh yeah, put the hat on. That. Yeah, I love it. I can't put a hat on with a headphones on my head though. No. How do you do it? I put it under oh. under that. Yeah, there you go. Hold on, I'm gonna do it. There you go. I'm that's, not a hat guy. That's perfect, dude. Look at that. It looks good on you. Mm. Yeah. I not, I've never been a baseball cap guy. Yeah, no. I, it looks all right. It looks good. It looks good on you, man. Mm. All right. Thanks. Are you are you ready? I'm ready. Do I have to open it now? You can open it. it but you, it you can you can try it. You should, it's a good thing you haven't tried. Can it I tell yet. you a true story? Yeah. I know we got. Well, this is going to go a long interview, yeah. but I'm going to tell you a story anyway. Okay. So I'm sitting with Josh Dorkin. You know Josh Dorkin, founder of Bigger Pockets, and I'm sitting with about a dozen of his buddies, maybe half a dozen. We were at his like birthday party, 40th birthday. I think I flew him. We surprised him. Went to this Mexican restaurant. All these big tough guys, the actors, and all these famous people. Not really that famous, but somewhat famous. And like everyone's having a great time. We go to the Mexican restaurant and somebody says, we should bring out the hottest salsa there is that they have here. And the, the people were like, oh, you guys don't want that. And we're like, no, bring it out. Let's try it. And, it, you know, stupid fun thing to do on a big guy's night out. So everyone takes a little bit and they're like, they're dying. Like they're just dying. And I like, I'm like Midwest. I don't eat spicy food. Never did growing up. Uh, I take a chip and I dip it in there. I eat it. I'm like. I don't know what these guys are talking about. So I did another one and another one. I ate the whole thing of salsa. That's crazy. I, I walked out of there a god. Like they were like <laughs> so impressed because like they were dying. So I just want you to know as you watch how easy this is for me. Okay. This is going to be just yeah, a walk in the park. No big deal. I'm not Good. even worried at all. Good. I'm not just the smell of this isn't causing my nose to run right now. 
<laughs> I'll tell you that we recorded with Nick and uh, he, we had to pause the recording. Like he couldn't take it. So um, mm. we'll see if you can live up to it, man. You know, and yeah, maybe that maybe the people, the guys that are at that Mexican restaurant are watching right now and they're, they probably are. And they're so excited for you to try it. So, yeah. All right, I'm man, impressed. you take a bite. I'm going to, I'm going to grab my first question here. There it is. Um, and you're, and you're like probably the one of the most avid readers I, I know. So favorite book could be something in the last year, a classic for you. What comes to mind? Four Disciplines of Execution by okay. Chris McChesney. Right, which is the one I just brought up. And why, why is that, man? So good. I needed a system to manage. Ooh, that's a little hot. <laughs> I needed a system. I'm sweating. To manage my people, to get everybody on one page. Not like employees necessarily, even though I have a few. But like... Everybody around me, like that, we're all working on the same thing. Ooh, that is hot. It's all moving towards the same direction and excited about it. And four disciplines gave me that framework. It's a perfect framework. It's like, what I want somebody to do, like, okay, imagine going to the gym. And somebody's like, okay, yeah, go to the gym and go work out. There's a lot of machines there. Just go have a good time. Just, you know, make sure you sweat. Mm -hmm. I'd go there and be like, what am I doing? What I wanted somebody to go, okay, I want you to do this many reps on this machine. Here's how you do it. Then move to this one and do it for this many minutes. And that's what four disciplines of execution was, was like, follow this framework exactly. And you will move the needle forward on your business continually. Yeah. I feel and like, it's proven true. I feel like yeah. I can do a whole episode on that book. It's been yeah. amazing for us. Yeah. It's been awesome. Earlier late riser. And what does it look like? Well, go, go ahead. Should do another one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are you ready? Yeah. Go ahead. Take another bite. Mm. And then, and then you can answer. Mm. It's, okay. it's got good flavor though, right? Like it's not oh, like a great flavor. It's not like just stupid heat. It's, it actually tastes good. It's, it does have stupid heat, but. It, t it actually has good flavor. Hey, am I allowed to drink my tea? You, whatever you want. We don't have any rules. You can drink milk. Okay. You know? huh. There's some cream in the milk. In the tea. Okay. I think milk might be at worst, though. I think I heard that once. We're anyway, gonna, keep going. We're going to find out. Er <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Early or late riser, and what does it look like? Uh, naturally a late riser, but I, by intention, an early riser. So I actually set, I actually have this journal. We actually came out with it at Bigger Pockets. Self promo right here. Yeah. It's all the intention journal. But in there, I have this, like my weekly battle planning and I track all the habits I'm trying to build. So in there, one of my habits that I'm building is I'm up by 6 a.m. every day. I mean, before 6 a.m., I'm up. And then I just track every, and I make it kind of a game. Like how many times have I done this? So like up by 6 a.m., 6 a.m. My goal is seven times a week. I did it on Sunday. Didn't do it Monday. Did it Tuesday and Wednesday. Didn't do it today. Today I slept till six six thirty. Anyway, at the end of the weekend, I can add up. Hey, I get five out of seven. Then I go and average it all at the bottom, and I say like last week, for example. Where am I? Last week I hit a seventeen out of twenty. So it was a pretty good week for trying to build my my things. Like yeah. the week before that was not seventeen. I don't remember what it was. Anyway, point being, I gamify my thing, and waking up early is one of those. Yeah. When yeah. I wake up early and I'm intentional about the start of my day. Everything in the day goes better Same. every time. Yeah. I always joke that I, I started getting up early because I got tired of getting woken up by kicking the nuts. Like a literal mm, yeah. kids jump. Yeah, in yeah. And then I wasn't happy to see them, right? And I want to be happy to see my kids. I want to I want to wake up like enjoying them, you know, um, yep. and embracing them. So uh, Agreed. any quotes you live your life by? Same what I said earlier. When you define your process and commit to it for an extended period of time, the results take care of themselves. That's one of them. The other one is Jim Rohn. That was hell out rod. Uh, the other one was, um, woo, hot. Uh, uh, Jim Rohn, because he has a million good quotes. But life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by change. I realize that quote a lot. So many people are waiting for the world to like change on them. When really it's like you have to be the change. And you have to do something different. That was a spicy piece right there. Spicy. Yeah, mm. they're all different. Uh, Some of them's got a little bit more of the seeds on there. Um, best under hundred dollar purchase. Oh man. Recent. If you have one, I'm going to go with the Jane Hawk novels from Dean Koontz. He's a, like a fiction writer, mm -hmm. very popular, written like 200 books now. Okay. But he's got a series. I started reading them on Kindle, the Jane Hawk novels. There's like five of them. Just probably the best fiction series I've ever read ever. Just phenomenally well-written. Yeah. And takes I just finished the last. It takes your mind off business stuff Everything. a little bit yes yeah every night now i read a fiction book before going to bed yeah so i kind of get shift out of that mode yeah i've done that. i'm sweating i've done that for <laughs> i've done that for like probably the past 15 years and now mm, i'm on nice. ja jack reacher like jack reacher oh, nice. like you know they're good yeah it's just it's just like you know this dude he gets to just be bust skulls and he can beat up everybody and just really yeah and funny you know 
I need to start that because like I need it. Like I was seriously sad last night. I finished the fifth book and it's the last book, and I'm like, what do I do? Yeah. What do I do? Ooh, that's hot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like not even close to being finished with this. No. Um, okay, I got a couple more for you, real quick, man. Um, is there in the last five years what new belief or be- behavior or habit has most improved your life? Or we can s- switch it and tell it another way. Ask it another way. What have you changed your mind about? Something that you were adamantly opposed to that now you're like, no, dude, that is, that's actually true. I used to think that things took a long time to accomplish, like big changes in life. This might be kind of a little bit too esoteric, but I'll say it anyway. So like I wanted to move to Hawaii someday. And I thought that would take me a decade to get there. It took me like seven months from the time I set the goal to actually move there. Uh, so... I learned that things, when you align your vision, especially your vision with a team around you, (coughs) woo, you can get, yeah. Mm. When you align your vision and you define what you want, define your process, build a team, like you can get there much, much quicker. So that's something I used to think that things took a lot longer to get. Like I think today, if I had to start over with real estate, I'd build a million dollar net worth in like under a year, Mm. maybe six months. Like it would just, things don't take long when you define your process and you know what you're doing and you practice the steps right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, things expand to fit the time that you give them, right? So if you're like, oh, this is a five-year yeah. goal. Yep. It's a completely arbitrary timeline. Why, yes. why is it going to take that long? I know plenty of people that were, went from unknown to known, went from no business to like insane amounts of revenue in a very short period of time. Yep. And I think part of it was that they had a beginner's mindset and they didn't think, they had no idea that it was supposed to take a long time. They just thought, well, this is what I'm going to do. And I want to build this big company and whatever, you know? And they just did it. Um, yeah. If you start with that and then you can do it. One of my buddies, um, he started flipping houses and he had never done any real estate really before, but he got around some people who are flipping houses like to a large level. And his first year he flipped a hundred houses cause he didn't know. Like, and I asked him like, how, how did you, like, I flipped like two a year and I'm like, how did you do a hundred? He's like, I didn't know you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> like he just did, like, right. He's like the guy, like, that's just what normal was for him. So he just went out there and his systems were just built so he could do a hundred houses in a year. Crazy. I love that. Okay. Yeah. Couple, couple, couple more quick ones. What's something a regular listener on the Bigger Pockets podcast wouldn't know about you? Um, I play music. I don't think people know that. Like I play guitar. Or I play for church like at least once a month now. Uh, play drums, a little bit of piano, bass. I like playing music. I like jamming around with friends. So I, I don't think a lot of people know that. I did not know you played the drums, man. Both of my boys play the drums. They love the drums. Now yeah, they're, they're going to think you're even cooler, bro. Good. Um, why all the references to Dancing with the Stars? Is it a secret problem for you? <laughs> if I talk about it enough, they'll invite me on the show. <laughs> I just started picking on it. I, I needed a random show to make fun of a couple years ago. So that's my, like, that's the antithesis of, like, was that antithesis? That's the wrong word. That's the epitome, yeah. is that the word? Of, like, wasting time yeah. at night rather than working on your future. Yeah. Of all the shows that like, I've actually been switching to the bachelor lately because okay. like dance with the stars is actually, a actually cool, kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. It is a cool show. Like the bachelor though, there's no redemption there. No, None. no. So. I remember walking out of a store. I don't remember what store it was. And there was two literal cowboys in front of me, right? Like cowboy hats, tight jeans, boots, everything. And I swear one of the guys looks at the other and he goes, if we hurry up, we can get home for dancing with the stars. And that's I'll never funny. forget it. It was like 15 years ago. And I thought, this is... Oh, well, that's funny. That should have been on forever. Yeah, been around forever. Well, actually, you want to know a really funny story? I make fun of that show all the time, right? Like, I say that phrase. We're getting a new uh, soundtrack for the Bigger Pockets podcast that's coming out here and shortly. It might even be out by the time this episode's out. New soundtrack for the beginning of the show. Because the original one was like a stock song from Apple from seven years ago. Anyway, the new song, it's a writer, it's a, a musician from Nashville who's a Bigger Pockets guy, wanted to help us. And so he, he wrote a song, like he, one of his songs, he said, you can have the license to this or whatever, we can do it. Another, though somebody else just got the rights to that same song to use on like, on like a promo commercial, Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> of all the shows in the world that would maybe purchase that song from him to use, yeah, it's the one show I bring up. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> it's perfect, man. By the way, I am almost done with these. What, Dude, well done, Turner. That's mm. amazing. Thank you. All right, last question. Your favorite Mission Meats flavor? The kid. The kid ones. Oh, the kid sticks. Is that a flavor? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, those are, are those are amazing. Yeah, they are amazing. Um, we we'll get them. In fact, just I went in the house just before recording this, and Rosie's like, so something like, Daddy, I ate a meat stick. And those are the kid ones. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, those love them, but I love them too. Those are good. Those have like a nice little smokiness to them. They're delicious, man. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, Brandon, dude, are you going to finish that bag? Finished. Last bit right here. Wow, dude, you're a machine, man. You I were, told you. You were not joking. I wasn't kidding. Yeah. I can handle it. I mean, I'm sweaty. <laughs> I got this. It is hot. It's so hot, man. Well, dude, I really. The milk makes it worse. The milk makes it worse. <laughs> it does, mm. right? Yeah. So I recorded myself on Instagram eating that whole bag. I did okay. I didn't do too bad. And yeah. then I drank this. I guzzled some cold water right when I mm -hmm. hit, right when I stopped recording. And dude, it was like it just switched all that capsaicin or whatever it's called all around my mouth. I thought I was going to die. Yeah, I'm not going to drink any water. I don't, think. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to cry for a little while. Just run around the house a little bit. Go take your dog for a walk. Yeah, I need cool. to. Dude, Brandon. Go get a chocolate blueberry. I, I'm doing it. That's right. That's right. I appreciate the time, man. If somebody wants to keep tabs on what you're working on, what's the best way? Yeah, Instagram. I'm like a 13-year-old girl when it comes to Instagram. So, uh, at Beardy Brandon. Beard with a Y. Beardy Brandon. Okay. Very good, man. Thanks for the time, bro. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. This has been fun. And well done. And hot. Later. Thanks so much for tuning in. It means so much to me and the entire Live Your Mission team. Now, at the end of every episode, what do I say? I say, please subscribe, leave a review, share the show with someone because that's the best way for us to grow this show, grow our reach, and spread the news about how other people are living their mission and how you can apply that to your life. So if you could do that for us, we'd really appreciate it. And then also, we're putting out content that viewers like you have asked listeners like you have asked about, right? Stuff that you want to learn about, topics and people that you want to hear from. So if there's anything like that that you want to share with me, email me directly, peter at missionmeets.co. That's peter at missionmeets.co. And I'll do my best to oblige. Now, if you would like to, just like Brandon did, consume a bag of Carolina Reaper jerky and do it on video and share it on social, and you want, because you want to be selected to win a hundred bucks of free Mission Meets products, and you also want this, the notoriety of uh, being selected, which I think is pretty, pretty big deal, right? I think it's a big deal, um, at least in our world it is. And so, um, if you want to do that, post on social, t tag us, hashtag Mission Reaper, and uh, who knows, man, you might win. All right, um, and that's it for now. Till next time, get out there and live your mission. Thanks so much.